Yeah, I've invested in a bunch of those Bauer brand tools from Harbor Freight. You know, the ones, the medium grade tools, the drills and the angle drills I got. I got the the uh, angle head grinder and uh, a bunch of batteries. Just a bunch of them, and they've all worked pretty good. The one that actually was the most useful for me is that light right I just showed you. But the other one is that uh, impact wrench. It's like a half inch battery powered impact wrench. And when you put the larger battery on it, the thing hits pretty hard. It breaks the wheel nuts loose on my backhoe and a bunch of other equipment I've had around the farm. Showed that on video once. One of the other things I've purchased recently is uh, a better DC to AC inverter. That one's a 400 watt continuous. It really should be plugged directly into the battery, but that would damage the warranty in my car. I can't do that. So I blended it with this cable. And uh, I just won't use it heavy. But it's got a lot more capability than what I'm using to charge up these batteries. And the thing is that as I go down the road, I just keep swapping the batteries for that charger. So I always have a full set of batteries that are charged. I don't think I've ever brought them into the house. And now I've been adding the camera to that mix for the camera charger. I'll eventually come up with a cleaner way of mounting all that, but that thing right there has really been a helpful addition to the channel. The other thing is I found this two and a quarter pound short axe. Never heard of Vulcan before. I happened to be up in Tupper Lake and there's a Tupper Lake hardware store and they had just one, so I bought it. I think what I'll do is I'll run it for a little bit as a wedge driver but eventually I'd like to rehandle it with wood off the hill. So those are two subtle things that have changed. Kind of interesting, yesterday I started out the morning getting a uh, old John Deere branded Echo to run. It ran beautifully. And then, wouldn't you know, when I went to visit Matt Sawyer, uh, he had one there too. So that was pure coincidence. That was absolutely not a setup. And... What I had done, just for a little bit of background, is that Holzforma G372X Torque that I did the build on, I was frustrated with it. I think it was 2019. I don't think I did it in 2020. Because uh, last year I was preoccupied with some other things. But anyway, I had built that saw and it was a real frustrating experience until we finally got it to where it was running good. And part of what I had to do was I tore it down and did my normal X torque build and you can look at the video for that but it runs good you know I put a I don't know a couple of tanks through it did a couple of cords of wood with that saw so I know it runs and usually what I do on things like that where it's kind of an experiment is I'll hand them off to someone like Matt he's the one who's willing to come on camera and let him go beat on the thing for a while and we'll see how and we'll see how long it lasts now right now the longest lasting of the aftermarket saws are the 660s and he's pretty much put them down because they're just big and heavy and suck down fuel. Of the 372 aftermarket saws, none of those saws really held up well and I had a bunch of the cases and three of them had the PTO side bear fail but, not but the bearing didn't fail itself. It actually beat the bearing pocket out of the case so the case material was soft. And in addition to that, one of those saws that had failed had the highway 52 millimeter pop-up top end. And I think that's one of the reasons why it killed that case. But it also killed the top end because the plating flaked off of that top end. But the bottom line is I just simply have not had the durability displayed on the 372 aftermarket saws that I have on the, the steel patterned 660s and stuff like that. So anyway, I'm rambling. I got stuff to do. Yeah, and before someone gives you some lecture about how this isn't that efficient, understand this is as much about exercise and trying to mitigate the damage as many years sitting on equipment in trucks. And before that at a desk. So this is my exercise. I do this to get exercise as much as I do to get firewood. So... I kind of enjoy doing this. When I need to get to it, 
I'll bring up a tractor or something like that with a trailer and get a whole lot more efficient. In the meantime, I'll do enough wood for an evening, you know, maybe two or three evenings. And uh, that's my day. That's my day's exercise before I get on to going back to the shop and doing other things. Not about efficiency. It's all about exercise. Well, today I think I am going to take that snag down. That'll be some decent firewood for the next week. So, what I do every year, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, is it's one of those heart attack avoidance type strategies when you get to be an old man and you think about, it, is I'll go up here and cut something down, block it up. If it's ash or cherry, I'll burn it within the same week because it can. If it's maple or beech or things like that, I'll put them down and let them sit for a year. But as the snow begins to fill up in the woods, it's harder and harder to get down in there. So I kind of like to have a good supply right along this hedgerow right here. And we had a couple of get-togethers up here. And one of the things that I started doing is cutting paths in and around the firewood so I could harvest it. And all that down stuff is ready to burn right now. I'll mix it in with my other firewood and stuff burns like gas. Right, so in line with that, I've got that one right there. You know, it's cherry, it'll never be a log, it'll be firewood. So, what I'll probably do is I'll take it down and clean up the top, pile it up, you know, and then uh, block it up and let it sit. I've been sort of watching the, the conversations online, and of course, they wind around the auto tunes because that's what's new both from steel and for husky. You have the M-Tronics and the, and the Auto-Tune systems. And I've been away from that for a while. I really didn't bite into it too hard because I like my old John Threads and Huskies. Now, where I left off with this saw right here, and that was when I had been injured and just prior to a major operation, I was really concerned about power and weight. So I took a Husqvarna 555 set of cases, new, and uh, built this saw where I actually had to use a crank that was uh, made for a 560 or a 2260 John thread because they're actually different. It has a stuffer crank where the 555 did not have a stuffer crank. Really a complex build, not what I would recommend. It's better to go either find a 560 Husqvarna or an old 2260 John thread and build it from there versus try to do what I did, which a very, very quick review on this series of saw. I did a video a few years back and I said there was five versions. There's actually six, I was wrong. There's four models that are small mount cases. And what I mean by small mount, they take the narrow uh, tail bar from Husqvarna and usually they'll run um, I guess you can get that bar both in 3 8 and 325, but it's a smaller set of cases. Now, because it has a smaller bar mount, that means the side cover and all the things related are different. But the four saws that were offered on the small mount version of this set of cases was the 555, the John Thread 2258, the CS2260, which was a John Thread offering, and the Husqvarna 560. And then the large mount cases, which are the ones that you're most familiar with, that was the 562 offering from Husqvarna. And I guess down in Australia or New Zealand, they offered a 556 or something like that, which was basically a lower cost version of the 562. It gets all confusing, but the big difference between the 560 and the 555 is based on the fact that the 560 and the 562 had a stuffer crank and a different ignition to allow something called rev boost and there was a whole bunch of things that were related to that. I don't want to get into the details. I don't have the time today. I should probably do an update video on that. But what's important is 
I'm going to bring this one back and run it for a little bit because I have work that really suits this kind of saw. And plus, I want to kind of get back into things with the auto tunes. I've been doing it, you know, working for a shop. I've been running common service tools, so I haven't like got away from it totally. It's just I've gotten away from it for my saws. Now, um, so there are six of these saws that are offered. Mixing and matching parts is not as easy as it is on, say, the 372 chassis or a lot of the 200 series chassis. And a lot of the differences are based on the fact that the the more expensive pro-level offerings had a stuffer crank and a different ignition system and a different carb. Now, another thing is there's an awful lot of consternation about Autotune versus the conventional saw. And I don't get it. I don't understand why. There's, the only thing that is inconvenient is a dealer has the common service tool, therefore he can flash the, the, a fresh carburetor. But once it's flashed, if you keep that with the ignition system or an ignition system with the same numbers, it's going to work. You know what I'm saying? And even if you mix ignition systems and carbs, it's like 25 bucks for a dealer to upgrade the carb. What's so hard about going down to your dealer? Um, and there are so many reasons for both the dealer and the customer who've got auto tunes to start connecting more. It's really, there's a lot of stuff that it brings to the table in terms of reporting on the saw understanding the life of the saw, service life, uh, understanding through the change in carb settings what's happening to the saw, you know, tracking that kind of stuff. They give you tools to do that. So the one thing that I see most important for a common service tool is just that ability to bring tools to the table that are tangible that helps the dealer talk to the customer as they go through life together with a saw. And that's before you get into the diagnosis tools, you know, the analytical stuff. Um, if you're intuitive, you can learn a lot just from the, the running history that's displayed on common service tools report. You know, what's happening with the carb settings, temperature, uh, how much time is spent idling, how much time in full RPMs, how many error codes, when the error codes happen, all that stuff. And I've done that in a video before, so I'm not going to go it now. But the gains you get with the Autotune and that system that Husqvarna gives their dealers common service tool far, far outweigh the, the liabilities. The other point I want to make is, and this is a very subtle one, and when Husky had issues with like the 562s with the cases and stuff like that, people lump it together and say, oh, those Autotune saws, as if the Autotune was the genesis of the problem, and it wasn't. Autotune as a system has been pretty reliable and Mtronic on the on the steel side as well. They had some issues with their solenoids. But for the most part, the dealer supports it and the system itself is pretty reliable, just like a CDI system was in its past. People complain from going from points to CDI, but once CDI got itself established, it's been the most reliable ignition system ever. And now these are a derivative of that just with a smart carburetor. And they're just as reliable. It's a reliable system. The saws that they wrapped that system around, on the other hand, had to be evolved. And that's not because of Autotune. It was because of the cylinder design and basically their desire to try to trap heat. And I went into that in one of my other videos where um, just the basic mechanical design of the saw created heat issues that showed up in things like uh, boiling gas in a carburetor, uh, vapor locking things had nothing to do with Autotune. For that matter, um, for that matter, Autotune allowed it to work around some of those problems. So those two concepts, the mechanical design of the saw plus Autotune as a system, you got to separate them in order to really get a true picture of what's happened with today's saws. To review, for just a short review, I, I just don't have the time to, to write a book on, on camera. But the way Autotune works is you have these three different modes, and this is actually pretty important. You have start, you have low throttle or idle, and you have uh, full throttle operations when it gets past a certain percentage point. Because on the carburetor, there's a, there's a throttle position sensor, right? The throttle position sensor plays into what fuel mapping gets used. And the firmware is all about that, about uh, the controlling the fuel mapping curve based on throttle position. Now, what's important is the start situation that Autotune deals with. Basically, it, it, it's going to feed fuel based on what the firmware says. And 
you're going to have a manual override called the choke. And what often happens is both auto-tune with its start fuel mapping and the choke working in concert likes to add a little more fuel for that start condition because they're trying really hard to make it easy to start. And what will happen oftentimes is um, uh, a user not familiar with auto-tunes will leave the choke on for too long and flood it out. And a lot of the early 550s were terrible that way. You know, you normally with an older saw, you pull the choke and keep pulling until it starts, and then you kick, kick the half choke, and then once it warms up a little bit, turn the choke off. With the auto-tune, you have both the manual choke plus the auto-tune itself playing a game there with the fuel, adding, trying to add fuel. So when you first start it, um, you're getting more fuel because of choking, but you're also getting a different fuel map because of auto-tune. And what I found in general is uh, if the fuel has been sucked into the carburetor, like using the primer, if you don't feel a pop in the first three or four pulls, turn the choke off anyway. <laughs> Leave the high idle on, but turn the choke off, because if you don't, the combination of the choke plus autotune has just flooded your saw. Okay? This saw here, I have not started today. It literally has not been started in at least two years. So I'm going to pump it up because the procedure is use the primer bulb to get fuel all the way through into the carburetor. I just filled it up with gas and that primer is really kind of sluggish. It's a little bit cold, a little bit stiff. So anyway, make sure that the whole system is primed. Oh, and before I get there, um, so you have the start condition, low throttle, and full throttle. At full throttle, what happens with these auto-tune systems, I don't think I've ever explained it because I've always assumed that Husqvarna would put a video out and explain it for people. So I'm going to give you a synopsis of what's going on. And this may disturb you. But what goes on is this, is your full throttle, that thing's spinning 13,000 RPMs, 10,000 RPMs, somewhere up there while you're trying to cut wood. What Auto-Tune will do is there's a little solenoid that opens and closes, opens and closes, and kind of flutters at a fairly high rate of speed doing that. And that's how it meters the fuel. If when it opens and closes, it stays open for a longer period of time before it closes again, that means it lets more fuel into the system. Conversely, on that same cycle, if it stays closed for a longer period of time, it means it's getting less fuel. So what'll happen is this thing is kicking along and the auto-tune will hold that, uh, hold that little, little solenoid closed for a couple of revolutions, right? Now what'll happen is that's gonna lean the mixture out just a little bit. If the RPMs pick up on the saw and it's detected by auto-tune, that means it needs a little uh, less fuel because it's running a little bit too rich. If, on the other hand, the RPMs drop off, that means it doesn't have enough fuel, so it'll add a little more fuel in the next set of cycles before the next test. So it keeps doing that. It'll hold it closed, it'll lean it out, it'll detect whether the RPMs are going up or down in that, say, five or six RPM test, and then it'll, it'll adjust slightly the mixture of the carburetor for the next period of time, and then it does another test. Closes off the fuel, watches the RPMs, it either goes up or down, and then based on what it sees, it'll either add more fuel or take fuel away, and then continue on for the next series. Now, now it's just continually doing that, always doing that lean test, always adjusting the, the mixture to try to get a more RPMs out of the saw. That's what it's shooting for, max RPMs. And that's why Auto-Tune will tune around other issues. So it's testing, 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 testing. Let's say a leaf comes in and slaps onto that air filter. It does the lean out test because now the air has been cut off. And as soon as it leans out, it starts picking up RPMs because it needs less fuel because of that choked off air filter. Well, the carburetor will start adjusting by holding the valve closed longer while it's doing its little uh, flutter routine, letting fuel through in order to lean the mixture out 
and then does another test, it'll do it again, it'll do another test, it'll do it again. Next thing you know, it's lean the carburetor down to a point to where it actually runs with that darn leaf sitting on top of the air filter. That's what's going on. I don't know if that makes any sense. Let's see if this darn thing will even start. It's been sitting for a long time. So after you've got this thing primed, is you take that multi uh, control deal, you pull it out, push it up, and that turns the choke on and it turns on the high idle. Wow. So in two pulls, I got a pop. Turn that choke off. was live and unedited. There it sits idling. So you can't tell me that there's auto-tune issues with that saw right there. Now that has at the time the latest and greatest firmware and EL48 carburetor. Yeah, it had a junk pile piston and a junk pile top end. But auto-tune makes it work. Yeah, so this is a funky tree. And there's not a whole lot of question about where it's going to go. It looks a whole lot bigger up close and personal. That's a 20 inch bar than it does when it's being looked at from afar. And since it's got all that stuff up there wanting to come down and hit me, see it? I really can't go back because there's all barbed wire in there. So I'm going to make my escape path right out that way.
all that, but that's the essence of Autotune right there. Nice running little saw. It's very lightweight. What a difference from my old saws. I love my old saws. I'm not going to change. But every once in a while, something like this brings you back to the, the 2021 reality.